and welcome back to another episode of Ability to Learn. And yes, it's me, Teacher Liz, your host again for Monday, November 9th, 2020. Ooh, it's getting colder outside and it's starting to feel like autumn, finally. Autumn is my favorite season of all time. Second place is winter. I guess I just like wearing jackets and boots and beanies and scarves. What about you? Anywho, I got a good show lined up for you today. We're going to a new place. We're learning about new animals and plants. Maybe not so friendly ones. <laughs> and also, I got a brand new Spanish word for you to practice all week long. Be sure to let me know if you're enjoying the Spanish word of the week. Or maybe if I should do one more often. I also got some new movie recommendations for you to watch and awesome observances for us to discuss. And don't forget, Discovery Learners, that we have live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day Program educational team. Be sure to log in at least once a day. Let's not delay any further. Let's go ahead and start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Scrapple Day. I love playing Scrabble. Wait a minute, it's not Scrabble the game, it's Scrapple, some type of food. S-C-R-A-P-P-L-E. Scrapple, what's Scrapple? Well, National Scrapple Day on November 9th recognizes the first pork food invented in America. For those not familiar with Scrapple, it is traditionally a mush of pork scraps and trimmings combined with cornmeal, wheat flour, and spices such as sage, thyme, savory, and black pepper. The mush is then formed into a semi-solid loaf, sliced, and then pan-fried. Scrapple is also known by the Pennsylvania Dutch name Panhaas, and the immediate ancestor of the Scrapple was the Low German dish called Panhaas. Local settlers adapted the dish to make use of locally available ingredients. In parts of Pennsylvania, it is still called Panhaas, 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 Panhaas. Many different uh, variations of uh, the same group of letters. During the 17th and 18th centuries, German colonists who settled near Philadelphia and Chester County, Pennsylvania, developed the first recipes for Scrapple. With such a rich heritage, many strongly associated Scrapple with rural areas surrounding Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and Eastern Virginia. So how do we observe National Scrapple Day? Well, best way to do it is to try some Scrapple. Try some Scrapple as you play Scrabble while drinking some Snapple. <laughs> However you want to do it. And just so you know, supermarkets offer Scrapple throughout the regions in both refrigerated and frozen cases. And Scrapple doesn't have to have pork in it. It can also include beef, chicken, or turkey. And instead of pan frying the Scrapple, you could try deep frying or broiling for a different texture. Scrapple makes an excellent breakfast side dish. And you can also eat Scrapple with a side of apple butter, ketchup, jelly, maple syrup, maybe some honey, horseradish, or mustard. You can also pause here so you can write down the recipe to make your own Scrapple at home. So have you ever eaten Scrapple before, Discovery Learners? Did you like it? Do you like the game Scrabble? Do you like the drink Snapple? <laughs> this is too fun. The names are so similar to each other. Let me know in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Fried Chicken Sandwich Day. Wow, all of these food observances are making me hungry. Yes, on November 9th, we celebrate the fried chicken sandwich. Is there anything better than biting into a fresh fried chicken sandwich? Hearing the crunch and feeling the crisp texture of the fried batter over the juicy slice of chicken beneath it? Or the buttery warm roll with mayo and crisp cold pickles? That experience merits a lot of respect. Which is why National Chicken Sandwich Day is taken seriously by food lovers everywhere. Chick-fil-A, you know that restaurant? 
Chick-fil-A allegedly invented the fried chicken sandwich sometime in the 1940s, according to the company. But recipes and many historians believe that the Scottish chicken frying techniques of lard and no seasoning and West African chicken pan frying techniques with palm oil and lots of seasoning were combined by African Americans in the South and thusly fried chicken as we know it was born. It is possible that someone happened to put a deliciously golden crispy slice of fried chicken between two slices of bread with a couple pickles during that time. Yes, in fact, ads had found in newspapers for fried chicken sandwiches predate the time period that Chick-fil-A claims to have invented it. Wow, that's pretty interesting. I like fried chicken. Some of my favorite restaurants to get fried chicken is Popeyes. But there's also, again, Chick-fil-A, Churches, and KFC. Those are some of the popular restaurants. So how do we observe National Fried Chicken Sandwich Day? Well, eat a fried chicken sandwich. Go to any of the restaurants I mentioned earlier, or you can stop by your local supermarket and pick up some fried chicken from there. And while you're at the store, you can also pick up some bread, some mayo, some pickles, and other stuff you like to put inside your chicken sandwiches. So how do you plan on observing National Fried Chicken Sandwich Day? Let me know in the comment section below. And our last observance for today is go to an art museum day. Do you remember how excited you were to go on a field trip to a museum as a kid? The first thing on your mind was probably, yeah, no class. But the big part of the appeal was the thought of going on an adventure. And on Go to an Art Museum Day every 9th of November, you can again. Because art is all about exploration. In fact, that's why we celebrate Go to an Art Museum Day. More than 30,000 museums around the world participate, and each year even has a different theme. Visiting a museum can be great. It gives us time to clear our heads. Sometimes it's nice to just turn off your phone and focus on something that's right in front of you. Looking at a piece of art and letting your thoughts drift can really be therapeutic. If going to a museum in person is not your cup of tea, you can always drop by the library or bookstore and pick up an art book. It might not be the same as seeing the print in person, but you also have the advantage of reading everything at your leisure. So today, go to the museum and discover something new. Now, given our current situation, some museums may be closed, but there are some museums open for free virtual tours. It's just a matter of searching for one online that has convenient times for you. So how do you plan on observing Go To Art Museum Day Discovery Learners? Let me know in the comment section below. On This Day in History Today, in 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte pulls off a coup and becomes the dictator of France under the title of the First Consul. Napoleon Bonaparte also known as Napoleon I, was a French military leader and the emperor who conquered much of Europe in the early 19th century. Born on the island of Corsica, Napoleon rapidly rose through the ranks of the military during the French Revolution of 1789 through 1799. After seizing political power in France in a 1799 coup d'etat, he crowned himself emperor and in 1804, Shrewd, ambitious, and skilled military strategist Napoleon successfully raged war against various coalitions of European nations and expanded his empire. However, after a disastrous French invasion of Russia in 1812, Napoleon abdicated the throne. Two years later, he was exiled to the island of Elba. In 1815, he briefly returned to power in his Hundred Days campaign. After a crushing defeat at the Battle of Waterloo, he abdicated once again and was exiled to the remote island of St. Helena, where he died at age 51. Today, on November 9, 1799, in an event known as the Coup of 18 Brumaire, Napoleon was part of a group that successfully overthrew the, the French Directory. The Directory was replaced with three-member consulate, and the 5-7 Napoleon became the first consul, making him France's leading political figure. In June 1800, the Battle of Marengo, Napoleon's forces defeated one of France's main enemies, the Austrians, and drove them out of Italy. The victory helped cement Napoleon's power as first consul. Additionally, with the Treaty of Amiens in 1802, the war-weary British agreed to peace with the French. 
Although, the peace would only last for just a year. Napoleon worked to restore stability to post-revolutionary France. He centralized the government, instituted reforms in areas such as banking, education, supported the sciences and arts, and sought to improve relations between his regime and the Pope, who represented France's main religion at the time, Catholicism, which had suffered during the revolution. During one of his most significant accomplishments was the Napoleonic Code, which streamlined the French legal system and continues to form the foundation of French civil law to this day. In 1802, a constitutional amendment made Napoleon first consul for life, and two years later, he crowned himself Emperor of France in a lavish ceremony at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Today, in 1989, East Germany opens the Berlin Wall. East German officials today open the Berlin Wall, allowing travel from East to West Berlin. The following day, celebrating Germans began to tear the wall down, literally. Many Germans showed up with hammers and chisels trying to break down the wall. One of the ugliest and most infamous symbols of the Cold War was soon reduced to rubble and was quickly snatched up by souvenir hunters. The East German action followed the decision by Hungarian officials a few weeks earlier to open the border between Hungary and Austria. This effectively ended the purpose of the Berlin Wall, since East German citizens could now circumvent it by going through Hungary, into Austria, then into West Germany. The decision to open up the wall was also a reflection of the immense political changes taking place in East Germany, where the old communist leadership was rapidly losing power, and the populace was demanding free elections and movement toward a free market system. The action also had an impact on President George Bush and his advisors. After watching television coverage of delirious German crowds demolishing the wall, many in the Bush administration became more convinced than ever that the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's statements about desiring new relationship with the West must be taken more seriously. Unlike in 1956 and 1968, when Soviet forces ruthlessly crushed protests in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, respectively, Gorbachev actually encouraged the East German action, as such as destruction of the Berlin Wall was one of the most significant actions leading to the end of the Cold War. So here's a quick recap. November 9, 1989, the head of the East German Communist Party announced that the citizens of the GDR could cross the border whenever they pleased. So that night, ecstatic crowds swarmed the wall. Some crossed freely into West Berlin, while others brought hammers, picks, and chisels and began to chip away at the wall itself. To this day, the Berlin Wall remains one of the most powerful and enduring symbols of the Cold War. If you can recall Discovery Learners, we have talked about pieces of the Berlin Wall when we covered the country of Germany. We also discussed how pieces of the Berlin Wall were sold off to art collectors and museums around the world. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure is recognizable to some of you wrestling fans. Chris Jericho, born November 9, 1970 in Manhasset, New York. This American wrestler became known to the WWE fans as the rock star wrestler Y2J and won 30 championships during the 1990s and the 2000s. He was the first man to become the WWE Undisputed Champion. He took a hiatus in 2013 after wrestling professionally for 14 years. And in 2019, he became the AEW World Champion. He turns 50 this year. Happy birthday, Chris. Our next notable figure is Christina Tosi, born November 9, 1981 in Ohio. This American pastry chef, author, and TV personality also co-owns Momofuku Milk Bar. She authored the cookbooks Momofuku Milk Bar and Milk Bar Life. She won the James Beard Rising Star Chef Award in 2012 and the James Beard Outstanding Pastry Chef Award in 2015. She also became a judge on the show Master Chef in the show's sixth season and also Master Chef Junior in the spin-off's fourth season. She turns 39 years old today. Happy birthday, Christina! And our last noble figure is Lou Ferrigno, 
born November 9, 1951 in Brooklyn, New York. This American actor, fitness trainer, and professional bodybuilder has won several awards and accolades for bodybuilding such as the Mr. America title and two consecutive Mr. Universe's titles. He also appeared in the bodybuilding documentary Pumping Iron alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is best well known for playing his title role in the CBS television series The Incredible Hulk. He also appeared in a few episodes as himself in the sitcom King of Queens. And in 2009, he appeared in the comedy film I Love You Man. He turns 69 years old today. Wow. Happy birthday, Lou. Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a country on the Horn of Africa. Do you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? That's the Ethiopian National Anthem. Let's take a look at the Ethiopian flag. The Ethiopian flag has green, yellow, red stripes, a blue circle with a star in the center and rays shining from it. The star symbolizes the unity of the people of Ethiopia, whereas the rays represent prospects of the future. The blue symbolizes peace, Red symbolizes the sacrifices made for freedom and equality. Yellow is a symbol of hope. And green represents the fertile land of Ethiopia. This current rendition of the flag was adopted October 31st, 1996. And is still being used today. Ethiopia's official name is Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And like I said earlier, Ethiopia is a country located within the Horn of Africa. It is bounded by Eritrea to the north, Jabalti to the northeast, Somalia to the east, Kenya to the south, and South Sudan and Sudan to the west. Ethiopia is the largest and most populated country in the Horn of Africa. With the 1993 secession of Eritrea, its former province along the Red Sea, Ethiopia became landlocked. Ethiopia is a federal republic with two legislative houses, the first being the House of the Federation, the second being the House of People's Representative. Ethiopia has a president and a prime minister. Its capital is Addis Ababa, which happens to be conveniently located in the center of the country. The official language in Ethiopia is Amharic, but some residents do speak English, and its official religion is Christianity. Ethiopia's main monetary unit is the burr. In fact, 38 Ethiopian burrs equals 1 US dollar. Its current population is 99,108,000 people. Ethiopia has a total area of 410,678 square miles. That is roughly a little bit smaller than the U.S. state of Alaska, about 33% smaller to be exact. Some of Ethiopia's main exports are coffee, leather products, and gold. Its number one money-making industry is agriculture and the production of coffee. As a matter of fact, the Arabica coffee plant originates from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of the world's oldest countries, and there is a lot to learn about it. So stay tuned all week to learn more about Ethiopia. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the spotted hyena, also known as the laughing hyena. The spotted hyena is native to sub-Saharan Africa, and it is listed as being of least concern by the IUCN on account of its widespread range and large numbers. The species is, however, experiencing declines outside of protected areas due to habitat loss and poaching. The spotted hyena is the largest known member of the hyena family. The other two members of the hyena family is the brown and the striped hyenas. The spotted hyena is further physically distinguished from the other species by bear-like build, its round ears, and less prominent mane, and its spotted pelt. And like I had mentioned before, the spotted hyena is the largest of the hyena family. Their body can grow to almost 2 meters long, which is about 6 feet. 
plus a dark bushy tail measuring about 30 centimeters long. Females are heavier than males and can weigh up to 82 kilograms. That is about 180 pounds. Spotted hyenas have a sandy ginger colored coat with black markings on their body and legs. They sport a cool short mane on their neck and shoulders too. They are famous for being scavengers. These cool carnivores have a reputation of eating the leftovers of other predators. But don't be fooled, they're super skilled predators themselves. In fact, they hunt and kill most of their food. Spotted hyenas are social animals. That means they usually hunt in groups and can take down a big animal such as a wildebeest, antelope, zebras, and young hippos. Smaller snacks on their menu include birds, fish, snakes, lizards, and insects too. These guys like to make the most of their meals. Equipped with a super strong jaw and teeth, they could chomp through every part of their victim. Yep, that includes the bones. The only thing they can't chomp through is the horns of an animal, like an antelope. They not only hunt in groups, but they live in groups as well. Structured ones, called clans, of up to 80 individuals most times. There's a strict hierarchy where females ring higher than males, and the group is led by one powerful alpha female. A female hyena can give birth to one or two cubs a year, which she nurses in a den. As youngsters grow up, the males will often leave to join a different clan, whereas females will remain in the same clan for a life. Spotted hyenas are also known as life and hyenas. Why? Because their highly intelligent creatures communicate with yells, whoops, and cackles, some of which be heard almost 5 kilometers away. That's about 3 miles. Wow, that's a long distance. In recent times, hyenas have been portrayed as pets in popular Hollywood movies, but it isn't a really good idea to have these animals as pets. One, because they are wild animals. And two, they carry rabies. Rabies is a very fatal disease that spreads through saliva. Once bitten by a hyena, you may develop rabies. Yikes. So what do you think of hyenas discovery learners? I think the babies are super cute, but the bigger ones are kind of scary. So what do you think? Leave your answers in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the white oleander. Oleanders are a tough, long flowering ornamental shrub or informal hedge that provides an effective screen in the southern landscape. The oleander flowers from early summer to mid-autumn with large clusters of red, pink, yellow, or white, single or double blossoms. The long, narrow leaves are smooth but leathery and is an evergreen that grows quickly but tolerates serious pruning to keep it in check. Oleander can even be trained into single trunk trees. Its one negative trait is the thing that is most likely to make you hesitant on planting it into your garden. Oleander is extremely toxic to humans and pets, every part of it, and the outcome of ingesting even a small amount of it can be dire. Its poisonous ingredients are two potent cardiac glycosides, oleandrin, and nearing. According to the National Institute of Health, the toxins in even a small amount ingested can lead to serious illness or be fatal to humans and animals. Symptoms of poisoning include serious heart rhythm disorders along with nausea and vomiting, cramping, and bloody diarrhea. It also causes confusion, dizziness, weakness, drowsiness, and visual disturbances according to the NIH. Yikes. But in subtropical regions where oleander's sturdy foliage and sweetly fragrant flowers are eloquently at home in deep south ornamental garden alongside with southern highways, this shrub can be an attractive addition to any landscape, as long as you heed the warning. Oleanders are a dense, fast-growing evergreen shrub that has been around since ancient times. It is native to North Africa and Eastern Mediterranean regions. It has been introduced to other subtropical areas and was brought to Florida in 1565 by early Spanish settlers. In the U.S., the white oleander grows in warmer climates such as southern coastal states like Florida and Southern California. The white oleander grows best in full sun and adapts to a wider range of soil types. Its ability to stand up in salt spray and drought is what makes it popular in coastal areas and very dry regions. It can grow up to a large shrub, some varieties up to 20 feet tall, or a small tree. 
and tolerates hard pruning in spring to maintain its shape. Once it's established, an oleander shrub needs only a little bit of water. Wow, these white oleander flowers are really pretty, but very poisonous. What do you think of the white oleander flower, Discovery Learners? Go ahead and let me know what you think in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Our first word is rabies. It's a noun. It means a contagious and fatal viral disease of dogs and other mammals that cause madness and convulsions, transmissible through saliva to humans. Rabies. Our next word of the day is landlocked. It's an adjective. It means in regards to a country, almost or entirely surrounded by land, having no coastline or seaport, landlocked. Hola Discovery Learners! Soy yo, tu maestra Liz! Hello Discovery Learners! It is I, your teacher Liz, and este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. La palabra de semana es gracias. The word of the week is gracias. It means thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Try speaking Spanish throughout the week by saying the word gracias. Again, gracias. That means thank you. Gracias. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Hi there, Discovery Learners. This is Andrew Lancaster with a brand new list of movies to watch this week. With Wallace Shawn's birthday right around the corner, why not take a look at his hit, The Princess Bride, starring Gary Elwes and Andre the Giant and our birthday boy, Wallace Shawn. From 1987, this adventure film has a 1 hour and 38 minute runtime, rated PG, and you can find it on Disney+. Plus. Since our Discovery learners love learning about space and science, we have the perfect movie for you this week, October Sky. This immersive docudrama starring Jake Gyllenhaal from 1999 has a 1 hour and 49 minute runtime, and if you're interested, you can find it on Hulu. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. Today's cinematic work of art is Matilda, based off the popular children's book by the same name, by Roald Dahl, and is heralded as one of the most faithful book adaptations of all time. The story follows Matilda, a young girl who was born different and feels like an outcast at her new school and even in her own home. She finds acceptance in her new friend Lavender and her kind-hearted teacher Miss Honey, who help her discover not only her secret powers, but also herself. At times, the story does take a darker path, but the picture painted by the writer comes through masterfully in Danny DeVito's film interpretation. The film provides wonderful set pieces and an upbeat soundtrack to help set the tone of the film. In the end, the story is about accepting your differences as what makes you special and not what sets you apart, and finding friendships in those who accept you for who you are is what life is all about. This cinematic work of art is rated PG with a runtime of 1 hour and 46 minutes, and it was made in 1996. And if you go looking for it, it can be found on Hulu. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that chewing gum was kind of invented by accident? It's true. The history of gum begins thousands of years ago. When prehistoric men and women chewed on lumps of tree or resin, a sticky brownish substance that oozes from trees. The ancient Greeks chewed on resin and so did Native Americans. Early settlers to New England loved to chew too. Gum made from spruce tree resin was a popular treat among early Americans. The first big breakthrough in modern gum technology came in 1869 when a young New Yorker named Thomas Adams began experimenting with chicle, a resin from the sapodilla trees. He thought he could combine chicle with rubber and invent a new material for making tires. His experiments were disastrous, but when Adams had another idea, if people couldn't drive on his chicle, maybe they could chew on it. Before long, Adams' New York number one chicle gum was all the rage. 
and by the late 1800s, the gum business was booming. A new product called Dentine came out, promising to help with dental hygiene. In around 1900s, an invented gum maker coated small pieces of chiclet gum with candy and chiclets were born. We went from someone trying to invent a new substance to make tires to chewing gum. So yeah, chewing gum was kind of invented by accident. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell icon so you don't miss out on any of the fun here at Ability to Learn. Be sure to tune in all week for every episode of Ability to Learn. Don't forget to attend the live Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Day program's educational team. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.